Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Do you TikTok? Have you ever wanted to TikTok? Do you TikTok? <laughs> tic, tic, TikTok <laughs> apopolis? TikTok, tic, tic, tic. <laughs> um, no, I have never TikToked. I have never wanted to TikTok. That seems really like like active. I Instagram a ton. I put my entire life on Instagram, but TikTok well, somehow feels too much. <laughs> and you took a you took an Instagram hiatus there for a while, right? I did. I yeah. did. It's it's invasive into my whole life. Like I can't stop looking at it when I have it on my phone. I can't yeah. stop posting things to it that aren't even, nobody even wants to see. I don't know why I put it there. I mean, probably someone wants to see it. Someone does. Yeah. I have this, I have this relationship with TikTok that during, uh, so when things in 2020, when things kind of all shut down, we were doing, this was before we were doing the podcast in its capacity and we were trying to figure out ways to do a lot of our science communication mm-hmm. uh, in more accessible ways because we couldn't go to people, we couldn't do anything. And so I started a TikTok account and we would, and it still exists, I haven't posted anything in quite some time, but I would do these TikTok videos with my dog. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Have you seen I've these? I've seen them, they're good. Okay, yeah. It was basically what not to do in science communication and my dog Tacoma, who yeah. anyone who's been listening for this for more than a few weeks has heard about would play kind of the the straight man to my <laughs> being an idiot <laughs> about Psygob. He has a voice. This is a Sakoma voice. Hi, Shane. How oh. are you doing? And yeah, I've uh, <laughs> but but I haven't done it in a professional capacity in quite some time. And I actually deleted the app from my right. phone because I just got it's, it's similar to you with with it's or I will say not similar to you, but I was on it too much and I wasn't yeah, contributing anything. In. And I was just sucked mm-hmm. in to mm-hmm. just joy scrolling, doom scrolling. I don't quite know which which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> Both at the same time? <gasps> Both at the same time. That's probably more accurate. Yeah. Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right. So TikTok has been in the news lately. And so I've been thinking about how it runs, you know, specifically the math and modeling, something like like it, how it uses things and how it predicts our behaviors and has these predictive algorithms that are behind so many of our experiences these days. Yeah, so TikTok and other social media platforms have algorithms and they're constantly tracking us. Mm -hmm. And that's why I see all of those creepy targeted ads and and pop-ups constantly asking me about cookies that I probably should look closer at, right? I short answer is yes. I, <laughs> I have actually gone through when the cookie things pop up. I do try to go through and say like, don't track me, which oh. is funny because most of these websites are websites I will visit once in my life and it's that time. But yes, mm-hmm. uh, that's exactly what it is. And I think the algorithms are not just predicting the content that we want to see in our social media feed, but they also predict things like medical needs, travel plans, and then obviously shopping. Yeah, so anything where lots of data becomes available is ripe for these algorithms. And the higher quality data, the more accurate it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's why, hopefully, <laughs> as we round about with most things, it'll bring us around to today's episode. Things like our weather and climate predictions will keep on improving because, in a positive way, because of algorithms. Mm-hmm. And so to tell us more, I'm going to bring in producer Devin Reese. Hi, Devin. Hey, Shane. My ears were actually burning when I heard that word algorithms and weather, because today that's what we're talking about. I learned a lot from this great interview with an assistant professor of Earth System Science, and she models atmospheric dynamics using algorithms. Ooh, tell us more about that. Well, so Jane Baldwin looks at how diverse streams of data coming in can be harnessed to predict things like cyclones. Yeah, and I imagine that's That'd be useful as we see things continue to heat up and and the climate change patterns keep changing. That may be redundant, but that's true. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was really struck with how this researcher is finding new ways to 
gather data from data streams that are not necessarily her own data and bring those together in a synthetic way. It's really cool. Or, or wait, wait, wait. It's hot. <gasps> oh. I appreciate that. I mean, we all know Vicky has no time for my shenanigans, no. but Devin doesn't either. So, <laughs> 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 all right. So let's let's get into it. My name is Jane Baldwin. I'm an assistant professor of Earth System Science at University of California, Irvine. I noticed a quote on one of your sites, I think on your Twitter site, that said, quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I wondered if we could start with you unpacking that a bit. Yeah, of course. So that quote actually has a double meaning for me, and I'll get to that in a second. The The standard meaning it has is that, you know, often, or why I put on my Twitter is that I work a lot with global climate models. I did my PhD training at Princeton and also NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, which was the first lab in the U.S. that actually, I think in the world, that developed dynamical global climate models. And, you know, often you hear in the scientific community, people criticize these models as saying, well, they have all these biases. How can we believe what they're going to say about the future? But I guess my attitude is that we should, of course, be aware of the biases, but we should also see what useful things we can do with the models despite these biases. So that's kind of how I'm always approaching my research. And you mentioned a double meaning. Like for you, what's the other meaning of, quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful? Before... I sort of seriously began my career as science. I worked as a fashion model for a bit. And (laughs) so I, this is like for a very small number of people who knew me at that time, they'll see that quote and send me a Twitter message and be like, ha ha, Jane, very funny. So uh, anyway, hopefully I try to make the computational models I work with be useful, but I also hope that even though I used to have a job where, you know, my hair mattered more than my thoughts, I can still do something useful now. I guess we'll find out today, huh? And in podcast format, we we can't see your hair anyway. When you were a kid, would you have been able to forecast, huh? That's my pun. Would you be able to forecast this career for yourself? I think definitely not. I mean, I never thought about being a scientist as a kid, mostly because I didn't know any scientists. Um, my dad studied physics in college. And so he, he works in business now, but he talked to me about physics. And I think that kind of was sort of the germ that probably resulted in me thinking the Coriolis is cool down the line and devoting my life to studying things affected by the Coriolis force. But other than that, I think... You know, it's hard to know now what's like, what is the result of your gender and what's the result of what you're exposed to. I wanted to be a fashion designer at one point. At another point, I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer. At one point, I wanted to be a doctor until I realized I'm terrible at cooking. And as a result, probably shouldn't be stitching up wounds. You studied earth and planetary science at Harvard. So at that point, you already had some orientation towards those sciences, right? Um, Yes, though I started out wondering if I wanted to be a physics major or environmental policy major. So my favorite subject in high school was physics. So I did like science, I guess. And and this is maybe partially a gendered thing. It, It was, I was the only girl in my AP physics class. And so when you're the only girl in something, it's not not even consciously, but sort of subconsciously. It's like, oh, like maybe maybe this is just not the right fit for me or something. I think that sort of intimidated, even though I did well in my physics classes in high school, that sort of intimidated me away from immediately starting to focus on it in college. A couple of years into my degree, I actually began to regret that decision because I was I had started this major at Harvard called Environmental Science and Public Policy, and it was a much more kind of integrative interdisciplinary major. 
So you felt you were missing out on something by choosing this broader degree with less of a basic research focus? I found myself really missing sort of the the depth and rigor of like solving physics problems. And it was sort of too late to switch into being like a physics or applied math major. But with what I had done, I could switch into earth and planetary science. And I think it was sort of a happy coincidence that at Harvard, that's the department that includes most of the climate dynamicists. And I was lucky to connect with Peter Hybers there, who's a great climate dynamicist, and he advised my senior thesis. And that really introduced me to research and got me excited about this whole enterprise. So I, I looked at a little bit about your Philippines work. One place that you seem to be pushing the envelope is that the modeling traditionally, and you mentioned it for your Philippines model, is, is focused on wind. And I see you're, you're trying to push the envelope to incorporate some other aspects like rain. So what, what are the other aspects of tropical cyclones that ideally would be in those models? Yeah. So, so in a perfect, so tropical cyclones have damages from a few different hazards or sub perils. You sometimes hear them described as so there's wind, but then there's also the sometimes extreme rainfall associated with the storms. And then there's also the storm surge. So the flooding that occurs by basically pushing the sea up onto the land. So you can have flooding from that extreme precipitation, but also from kind of this coastal hazard of the, the ocean or the sea. There, this is a huge problem trying to figure out how to model all these different hazards and especially how to model them in the context of a changing climate. And research groups all across the country are working on different aspects of this. Um, so I think the state of the field right now is you're seeing a lot of studies that are kind of looking at compound sea level rise and storm surge hazards. And then you're seeing another study that's pushing in the direction of looking at wind and rain. How challenging is it from a mathematical point of view, or how challenging will it be to bring together these different risk models, say the one based on the two-dimensional wind and the one on precipitation, without getting in the weeds? <laughs> Just what has to happen mathematically to do that? I think it's I think it's a pretty big challenge. So part of the challenge is the different spatial scales of these different models. So wind, as an example, we have reasonable approximations to be able to, you know, model wind at relatively broad scales. But if you're getting into really fine spatial details over land, the roughness of the landscape and kind of mountains and textures of different surfaces can impact the wind speed that you're actually experiencing, particularly in the boundary layer. And for a study like I did in the Philippines, you know, those details might matter, but because of how we we're calibrating the vulnerability, it wasn't a big deal. But once you start to think about modeling storm surge on top of it, storm surge models, the a lot of the best ones are actually kind of very explicitly and dynamically modeling how those parcels of water are being pushed onto the landscape. I think you're unpacking really well that quote from your Twitter that all models are wrong, but <laughs> they still have utility. Because what I'm hearing is that for you to model cyclones, you have to model all these elements of cyclones, the wind, the precipitation, the storm surge. And then on the other Part of that is to model what those do on the ground. You have to model a whole set of vulnerabilities. We're kind of trying to one at a time add in these different hazards and hopefully at some point we'll come together and we can model them all at the same time. The like grand vision is that down the line we can have a risk model that can account for these different hazards. We're not there yet, but it means there's good science still be done, I guess. But but I've talked to some people who have sort of said, well, you know, the reality is if you try to model too many things, the problem just becomes too complicated and 
you know, it might be more productive to sort of stay in your lane and like focus on the hazard and do as much as you can with the hazard. But I think in the context of the fact that the climate is already changing, that people are trying to figure out how we adapt to it, we need to make some kind of effort to like kind of cut across these disciplines so we can actually be modeling the impacts in a rigorous way and not just the hazard. Cause what like a community on the ground, they can't do that much with just knowing how wind is going to increase into the future. They need to know more about the vulnerability and exposure as well. How would you categorize sort of the range of vulnerabilities that's on the other side of the models that you are trying to tap into? Well, maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges we dealt with in modeling vulnerability for the Philippines, as an example. So when we were starting that project, what existed was there had been a study that had fit vulnerability at the country scale. So one estimate of vulnerability for an entire country due to tropical cyclones. And when we applied that for the Philippines, we found that it did a good job of capturing damages when storms went through Manila, the capital of the Philippines. But when storms didn't go through Manila, it really didn't work very well for capturing damages. And this is because in the Philippines, Manila is so much more built up than everywhere else in the Philippines that if you calibrate your vulnerability around that region, you end up estimating that the rest of the Philippines is going to be a lot more robust to tropical cyclones. And what could be the real consequences of, of poorly, poorly aligned calibrations that would affect your estimates of cyclone damage? You know, if all you care about is the total number of dollars lost, then maybe it's not a big deal. But if on the other hand, you're trying to get at, well, what are the actual impacts of these events for people on the ground and the well-being of people on the ground? So I'd say... The main challenge in that study was actually thinking about how we could accurately capture vulnerability on the ground in a way that allowed us to say something useful about storm risk across the Philippines. So the group that I I started that work when I was a postdoc at Columbia, and I'm still continuing it now as a professor at University of California, Irvine. And we have a pretty good handle on the hazard from tropical cyclones, meaning the physical impacts from these storms. So their wind and how that intersects with human population. But to accurately account for risk, you need to know the hazard, the exposure, but also the vulnerability, like the fragility of people and structures in the face of that hazard. So really, modeling needs to consider what a catastrophic weather event like a cyclone physically brings in terms of wind or storm surge and what's vulnerable on the ground when it hits. I mean, true. In that sense, these modelers who don't have much time for their hair anymore are predicting (laughs) interactions between the physical variables and the human variables, right? Yeah, I like a tropical cyclone is going to have a very different impact on an uninhabited island compared to an island developed for tourism or industry or something else. It's like the physical data alone, which is often what we hear is telling just half the story. And the other half is related to vulnerabilities on the ground. So basically, you're looking at vulnerability, and when you describe the assets, I hear you talking about homes, and buildings, but what what other things would fall into that category of assets that you would want to include in your modeling? Yeah, so you're also talking about what products are created in a place and maybe, maybe sold. So basically things that contribute to economic value. So not just homes, but also businesses. And, and this is why, you know, there are, there are kind of the World Bank and other development banks have estimates of assets at some gross scale. And when storms impact the Philippines, there are definitely agricultural losses that occur. Because if you look at the situation reports, so these are reports put out by like Philippines emergency services after a tropical cyclone or typhoon has struck, 
you see a lot of losses coming from agriculture. But I found out later on after I talked to someone who had worked in the Philippines on the ground that those numbers may be fudged, basically, to ensure they get the payout they're hoping for from the central government. I think agricultural losses might be easier to reimburse than other types of losses. So are the agricultural assets sort of omitted because that data you described from World Bank or IDB does not include those in their inventories? That's a good question. And I think there are other data sets, like there's something called SPAM, which is basically tries to estimate where agricultural products exist across the world. And so incorporating a data set like that might perhaps improve how we're estimating assets in this model. I love the name SPAM. <laughs> I know. I do too. Scientists come up with some great acronyms at some sometimes. Who knows what really goes into those cans of spam. So I think it's really interesting that your your work relies on various data streams that are not your own, right? You may you can tell tell us. It'd be interesting to hear if you use some of your own, but I, I hear that you're having to cull from different data streams owned by different organizations or actors and then bring that into a model. And I'd love to hear a little more about the challenge of bringing that data in and making that all work together to generate the predictions you're looking for. Yeah. So to start, I'd say the main part of the data that is more firmly kind of my own or the group I collaborate with own is we've developed this Columbia Tropical Cyclone Hazard Model, which is basically a way of simulating many, many physically plausible tropical cyclones. And that underlies the hazard component of the data. But we had to talk a lot with other teams to figure out how to model the exposure and the vulnerability. And, you know, I, I think that process of working with these other types of data sets, on the one hand, it, it's very satisfying, but I also think that a, a challenge in doing this is sometimes your process for figuring out the right data set or the right person to talk to is going to be quite a bit more meandering than if you're kind of staying in your lane and just working with the hazard data. So I feel like patience has been important and also being willing to kind of go in some directions that ended up maybe not necessarily working out and then switching gears after a while. So I'm getting the impression that your work requires a lot of collaboration, that you literally couldn't do it if you weren't a good collaborator, because you're you're talking about how your data relies on certain relationships that you're establishing. Yeah. I mean, I still feel as an early career scientist, I'm still figuring out my style. You know, I'm only a year and a half into my professorship. And kind of learning lessons about what does and does not work as a collaborator. I think I am very broadly interested. So it's pretty easy when I'm talking with a collaborator, even if they're talking about things that are not exactly my training for me to get excited about what they're saying. And I think that can be helpful in forging collaborations because it's easy to communicate, you know, my enthusiasm for what's happening. I think the, the part I need to be tricky, careful about sometimes is sometimes I can find myself going down some rabbit hole that I got excited about, but I'm kind of losing the forest through the trees. And so there's always this tension between my desire to like collaborate with everyone because everyone's everything's interesting, but also keeping the idea that, okay, what are the next concrete steps I can make that move towards some like substantial contribution? basically. And as you can see, when I'm talking about this project, I'm like, well, we could have modeled the agriculture and we could have worked with hazards. And there are all these kind of like different directions I considered that at some point I had to be like, okay, we've done enough. Like, let's, you know, move forward with this. Down the line, maybe if I had some piece of funding that was focused on doing, I think it would be cool to do a deep dive in, into hazards and see what pieces of information might be transferable to other countries, even though it has a U.S. focus, but that ended up being a bit outside of scope of the work we were doing. 
So there are trade-offs then between getting sufficient data for your main research task, but also being opportunistic about you know other related lines of research. So you're saying something useful, but not trying to answer every question one could possibly answer. I think at the stage of my career that I'm at right now, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about. Because when you're a PhD student, when you're a postdoc, you have mentors who can kind of put the reins on what you're doing and say like, okay, that's great, but you know, stop here. And once you become a principal investigator for the first time, now you're the person who has to do that. You have to tell your grad students, okay, that's cool, but you've done enough. Don't do more analysis in that direction. It's time to write it up. And so that's, I think, the non-stationary component of the climate system, no matter what you're working on, ends up being something you start worrying about at some point. And whether you need to address it or not really depends on the project. But it's also interesting. It means that, you know, there's lots of things to do in this field, which is cool, too. So as climate continues to change, what's that going to do to your work? How is that going to affect what you do? Well, one of the, this is more of a personal effect it's had and less an effect on the actual research. but. You know, when I started grad school, um, something I liked about my work was that, you know, I could open up the New York Times and see something related to climate change. And so it felt like the scientific research that I was doing had some relevance to the world around me. And that was motivational. I'd say it's begun to move a little bit from motivational to overwhelming at times. It feels like every time I turn on NPR, there's another conversation about some extreme event that's occurred. And, you know, they're interviewing an expert who is often someone I maybe know. And, you know, it it's it becomes, uh, you know, sometimes to be able to keep doing this work, you need to take a break from it. And sometimes that requires me to kind of get away from the media sources that normally I like to see just because, the reality is because these events are beginning to occur and have demonstrable impacts from climate change, they're getting a lot more media attention. But isn't the media attention a positive, you know, for bolstering the field of climate change science, looking in the bigger picture? In, a grand, in the grand scheme of things, that's awesome because it means we'll hopefully actually begin to take substantive action around them. But in terms of my research direction... I think I'm, so as an assistant professor, I have a bit of a balancing act to do between doing things that contribute to fundamental scientific progress and doing things that contribute to the needs of the moment. And those aren't always totally at odds, but sometimes they can be a little bit at odds. For example, there was over the holidays, a bunch of atmospheric river events that occurred in California and resulted in an unusually large amount of precipitation. And I, it was hard for me not to think, oh, maybe I should drop everything I'm doing right now and try to do an attribution study of how these atmospheric river events, these particular ones have been affected by climate change because that would be so relevant. You know, I was getting some media interview requests about it. And I was sort of unsatisfied by some of the answers I could give. But at the same time, I have, you know, a funded NASA proposal to better understand biases in climate models and how they're driven by mountains. And that's kind of more like a slower running, but important for just improving our climate science understanding in general. And so we're at this interesting place now in climate science where this data associated with our climate projections is beginning to be used in like real on the ground applications. And um, I definitely, because I'm a human who cares about the world being a better place, I definitely want to service these applications, but I'm also just one person. So anyway, that's, that's just all a way of saying that I think there's going to be this push and pull between the slow relatively slow pace of science and what feels like this quickly increasing, you know, danger, frankly, that we're experiencing from the changing climate system. And I think not just me, but my grad students and the other professors I work with are all kind of grappling with this right now.
Jane almost sounds like an MD with some sort of regular office practice, but who also needs to do their time in the ER. Oh, that's so right. The modeling work provides the underpinnings to be able to better make better predictions about mm-hmm. extreme weather. But meanwhile, the urgencies of climate change affects our calling to her every day. Yeah, and I imagine as the climate intensifies, there will be more patients in the ER, continuing along this metaphor. Mm-hmm. The ER is the earth. So I, I get that it's a push and pull. I, I think in science, aren't there, there are always like tough decisions to be made, right? About how to allocate time between the basic research that might be on a longer time frame. It takes longer to get it done and applied research to try to get quick answers when there's some triage situation. I was wondering at what point did she start grappling um, with having to make decisions about balancing basic resource on climate and some of these other emerging needs? I think, in fact, it was only towards the end of my PhD that I even began to think that, you know, I definitely wanted to become an expert in climate science, but I wasn't sure if my direction should be more going to say policy and trying to have more of a direct impact on the ground or still working on the scientific questions. And I guess how I ended up feeling at the end of my PhD was I still had a lot of unfinished business in climate science, and it was hard for me to put those questions down. And so it was the right fit for me, but I didn't talk about this in detail, but I used to be in college pretty involved in environmental activism and ultimately got out of it, not because I didn't care about, but because I thought I was kind of a bad activist. You know, I get very wrapped up in the whys and that really makes me well-suited to science. So if you could look out five years, what would you guess that you'll be working on or or sort of idea in in the ideal scenario, what would have been figured out and what would be therefore the next steps of what you're researching? This is something I'm, I've been thinking about a lot right now. You start being asked when you're kind of like a couple years into a professorship, start thinking about applying for these grants where they want you to kind of chart out these longer career trajectory type things. I would hope that I still have a foot in kind of fundamental climate dynamics, but also in these more interdisciplinary questions, because I think that's really what I can bring to those interdisciplinary questions is a deep understanding of the climate uncertainties. You know, I don't think it is the right thing to just turn myself into an economist or epidemiologist, because I'm sure there are people who can do those things better than me. I would hope that we had developed better tools to simultaneously grapple with the uncertainty from the climate system in with global warming, but also the uncertainties coming from vulnerability and exposures. I peeked in at your AGU Geo Health Showcase last week. You were talking about all the uncertainties around how many people will perish, for example, in a heat event and the role that humidity plays. So the crux of what you do, from what I'm hearing, is you're, you look at the relationship between sort of these climate, weather events, and human health vulnerabilities, dealing with different streams of data for your models, and then judging from your talk last week, the streams of data don't always agree with each other. So you're basically working on a super complex moving target. Yeah, don't say it that way. That's getting me demoralized, you know? No, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, but I think that the thing is, you know, I've sometimes had conversations with, like, I remember talking with an economics PhD student in grad school. I was talking to him about climate models and he kept telling me, like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, how can you project things into the future? You're extrapolating. And I realized after talking to him for a while is because he was from the framing of he always worked with statistical models. And if you have a statistical model, of course, you can't really extrapolate into the future. But the thing with climate models is we have the Navier-Stokes equation. There are definitely things we know and there is stuff we can like hang our hat on in climate projection. So you're looking forward to more synthetic, holistic models based on all this hard work that many people are doing. Yeah, but but uh, not necessarily like capturing everything in one big model, but more just understanding from these 
different silos of academia that are thinking about vulnerability versus exposure versus hazard coming together in a way that we can sort of align our research in a slightly more sensible manner than I think what what sometimes happens. I think maybe if we had more holistic frameworks for thinking about this, we could be a bit more targeted in the climate questions we're asking. So I would hope I had started to be able to figure out how to feed back these more interdisciplinary projects into fundamental science questions that were really of greatest relevance to risk facing society, basically. So if I come full circle or was beginning to, that would make me really happy. <laughs> Jane definitely prompted us, or at least me, to think about how climate data interfaces with information about human vulnerabilities, right? To improve predictive models, these predictive models of extreme events. Yeah, and I feel like she really drove home the quote on her Twitter site that all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely something here related to the, that saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Oh man, I mean, that's basically my motto these days. Though I don't I don't want to put words into Jane's mouth. Uh, I will thank her for the great work that she's doing and to sitting down to chat with us. And with that, that is all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much, Devin, for bringing us this story and to Jane for sharing her work with us. This episode was produced by Devin with audio engineering from Colin Warren and artwork by Jay Steiner. And be sure to head over to the Care of the Two podcast next week for more from Jane on the math and stats front. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the podcast, so please rate and review us, and you can find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. Okay, that's fine. Can I ask you a question? That you, Tacoma voice? You just did. Hi, guys. Do you use that voice other times, or was it only a TikTok voice? Like, do you make uh, your dog talk? Oh, no, that's his. Oh. We, so we went, uh, we were in Richmond this weekend. Oh. Just like, we go to Richmond once in a while. And I, I had a discussion with Kristen through the dog yep as we were like walking through a park for 20 minutes this and yep. Kristen was the dog and she was doing the voice oh. and i was <laughs> me <laughs> and i was imbuing this sense of tacoma was mad that we took him on this trip that he didn't want to go on yeah and we just we we did the shtick for 20 minutes in this park <laughs> People were looking at us. It was a whole thing. <laughs>